Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I, oh, I like the howdy. <laughs> um, I didn't mention last night I had such a good time interviewing Brother Jared the other day. <laughs> And uh, his podcast with me will come up a week from tomorrow. So uh, if you don't know how to find that again, just go to our website and go to the media button and drop down. You can find it there if, you, if you're not familiar with podcast, Or if you are and you want to know how to talk with me. Tomorrow we have a new one coming up. And it is just one of the finest Christian ladies I've, I've ever known. And she's just a, a sweet lady and uh, a wonderful person. She happens to be my, my youngest daughter. And uh, she's a children's ministry director and involved in a lot of other things. We do a lot of personal talking on that one tomorrow, um, more than any I've ever done, and talking about being a PK a little bit. We were, someone was just mentioning that tonight, and and uh, so I encourage you to listen to that. You might enjoy it as well. And, and uh, your preachers, i got to go back and find what number that is so I can tell you from last year. you got to go back if you haven't heard his interview. It was really good as well. <clears throat> All right. Let's begin. I've always got to start with a prayer, even though uh, Brother Malcolm did too. It's just uh, what I do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your blessings of this day. Thank you for everyone that has gathered here. Again, this is no accident. Uh, you knew who was going to be here, and you knew what the word would be. So bring it to us tonight, Father. Let our hearts be open. Touch my tongue, my lips. And let us hear your word, not mine. And we'll give you the praise and the glory, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's start with a little background. The kingdom of Israel was at war with the kingdom of Syria. The Syrian king realized that every time he made a move, the king of Israel was a step or two ahead of him. He thought there was a spy in his camp. But no, he was told that Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Whoa! In other words, any decision he made was known to Elisha the moment it was made. Elisha would then give the king of Israel a heads up. When the king of Syria realized what was happening, he sent a couple of guys to go get Elisha. No. No, he didn't send a couple of guys to go get him. He didn't send a squad. He sent his army. He sent his army to get this one dangerous man, Elisha, and capture him. And that brings us up to date with our text tonight in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 to 23. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open the eyes that he may see. Open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And as soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. That's quite a story, isn't it? That's quite a story. Uh, of course, if, if you are a Christian, 
you would probably admit that you believe very much in the predominance, power, and plan of God. Then my question is, why are you so afraid? If, like many Christians I meet as we're traveling, you are afraid, do you live like the child who is sure that there is something in the closet or under his bed that's going to get him? Is that how you're living your life now? Are you closing your eyes tight because of fear, hiding your head under your covers, or ducking under your pew, afraid of the dark that surrounds you? Which raises another question. Are you looking at the things that are seen or the things that are unseen? Open your eyes. And like Elisha, see what others cannot or will not see. If you were in Brother Malcolm's Tuesday morning Bible class, you would have heard this scripture today. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4 17 and 18. A.W. Tozer said, Faith is seeing the invisible, but not the non existent. Amen. There are some wonderful blessings for the person who will open his or her eyes. We need to quit closing. We quit, need to quit fearing and hiding under the pew. When you open your eyes, you will see God's predominance. Amen. Elisha's servant was frightened. He walked out and, I mean, look, he sees, he sees a whole army surrounding him. He felt he and his master were alone against a great army set on their destruction. So he did what most of us would do. He panicked. Oh, oh, oh master, master, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I don't know. What are we going to do? Come here, come here. Look at this. They're all around us. What are we going to do? Now, we might expect Elisha to come up with a cunning plan of escape or a great hiding place or just hand himself over to the Syrians and hope for the best. But he did none of those things. Instead, Elisha calmly replied in verse 16, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. His servant was in need of an encouraging word that would calm his fears and bring peace to his heart. And Elisha said what he needed to hear. But when he said that, open your eyes, be calm. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Can you, can you see the servant? Looking at Elisha and looking around him and looking back here and looking back at Elisha and looking at the army and saying, yeah, right. <laughs> Are you frightened, friends? Are you frightened when you look around and see the darkness that's coming in around us all over? Do you feel all alone? Surrounded by a great army bent on your destruction? The destruction of your faith, the destruction of your family, perhaps the destruction of your country or even your life? Are you frightened of this? Well, take heart, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Amen. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and courageous. I will admit, brothers and sisters, we are surrounded by enemy forces. If you didn't know we were in a spiritual battle several years ago, certainly you know it now. And we are surrounded by enemy forces. But you know what? I, I feel sorry for those, those poor 
misguided fools. And yes, don't somebody say, oh, you can't say fool. Yes, I can. Psalm 14, 1 tells us, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And I feel sorry for those poor misguided fools. These poor misguided fools, they think they can destroy our faith. 2 Corinthians 4 again, verses 8 to 10. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Oh, Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Amen. They think they can destroy our family. Galatians 4, 4 to 6. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, you cannot destroy God's family. You can't do it. People have been trying to do that for thousands of years. You cannot destroy God's family. They think they can destroy our country. John 18, 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. How can you destroy something that you don't even understand? They cannot destroy the kingdom that we are citizens of. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And we need to remember that. First and foremost, and I think I've told you before at my home, I have one flag holder. It's just the way it's set up out there, the way I can do it. And on 4th of July, I fly the American flag. And on Memorial Day, I fly the American flag. And on Veterans Day, you better believe I fly the American flag. Because I'm an American and I want to thank those people who have given their lives and those who have served. And I want to remember the country that I live in. But you know what I fly the rest of the year? The Christian flag. Because I am first and foremost a citizen of the Kingdom of God. Yeah. And I'm thankful to be a citizen of this nation as well. But the kingdom that I am first and foremost a citizen of, nobody can destroy. And if you are a Christian, nobody can destroy the kingdom you are a citizen of. They think they can destroy our lives. 2 Corinthians 5, 1-3 says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. So they cannot destroy our lives. All they can do is help us to put on our heavenly dwelling. All they can do is help us to move us along in our eternal walk. But they cannot destroy our lives. And for someone to say, well, I, I, I better get along, they're liable to kill me. They can't kill me. They can kill this. They can, they can stop this house from, from functioning, but they cannot kill me. Because my life, when I accepted Jesus Christ, was baptized into Him, I gained eternal life. And so I can take a stand for Him, and I am happy to do it. Now someone said, well, you know, I, I don't know if I can do it. Let me tell you, I thought of this a long time ago. It would be a lot easier to take a bullet for Jesus than it is to live every day for Jesus. You know, go out with a bang, so to speak. Go out with a flash of glory. But you know what, living every day, getting up every day and serving Jesus, that's a little tougher. This Christian life is not for wimps, you know. I've been saying that, <coughs> I've been saying that about being a senior citizen now. <laughs> And I told you, you know, I'm starting this month, I'm getting Medicare. And you know what? That's confusing stuff. That's confusing stuff. 
My daughter, the one I'm interviewing tomorrow, she came by to see us, came from Oklahoma over to see us last month. And had I not had her help, I wouldn't have got through that stuff. You know, this, 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 this getting old is not for wimps. And neither is this walking in the Christian life day by day. So they think they can kill me. No, they cannot. They cannot destroy my life. They can only uh, bring glory to it. They are the ones who cannot see. They're the ones who cannot see. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. I feel sorry for them, not us. There are people in this world, and it still surprises me, that you can share the love of Christ with, you can talk about Jesus, and they are just blinded to it. The world has so blinded them they cannot know. They just cannot know Jesus because they become so blinded by the lies of this world. When you open your eyes, you will see God's predominance and God's power. Verse 17, Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wow! Can God really do that? Of course he can. That's right. Yes, of course. Psalm 34, 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. That's just what Elisha's servant saw when his eyes were open. An army of angels riding fiery chariots. Do you think his attitude changed? Now that's powerful. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus mentions this angel army. When Peter drew his sword against those who came to arrest Jesus in Matthew 26, 53, Jesus said, Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and He will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? Twelve legions equals 72,000. And that's not all of them. He says he'll send me more than 72,000 angels. That's a lot of angels, brothers and sisters. That's the line. They encamp around those who love God and serve Him. In perilous times like these, we need to remember God's power. We need to hold our head up and remember God's power and quit being so frightened. We need to know God's angels are surrounding us and reminding us that God is mightier than any enemy we may face. A great example of this unseen army comes from a missionary story. John Patton was a missionary in the New Hebrid, Hebrids Islands, now known as the nation of Vanuatu. One night, hostile natives surrounded the mission station, intent on burning the patents out and killing them. John and his wife prayed during that terror-filled night that God would deliver them from these hostile natives. When daylight came, they were amazed to see the attackers turn and leave. A year later, the chief of the tribe was converted to Christ. Remember what had happened, Patton asked the chief what kept him from burning down the house and killing them the year before. And the chief replied in surprise, who were all those men with you there? Patton knew that there were no men present, but the chief insisted and said he was afraid to attack because he had seen hundreds of big men in shining garments with drawn swords circling the mission station. <laughs> Having God's power with us, though, does not always mean that we won't have to go through the fire. So we need to remember that. Just because we have His power with us and the angels protect us, sometimes we have to go through the fire to get to where God wants us to be. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown right into the fiery furnace. And they came out alive. 
Daniel, in chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, then Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. The fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come up upon them. And if you remember the guys who took them and threw them in the furnace, they burned up. Yeah. Daniel, I like that. We sang about that tonight. Isn't that wonderful God puts that together? Daniel still had to go into the lion's den, didn't he? Daniel could have said, well, where's my angels? They ought to be surrounded. I shouldn't have to go in there. But he still had to go in the lion's den. It was there that he saw God's power. In chapter 6 of Daniel, verse 20, as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in the tone, a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Yes, even from the lions. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, also saw God's power. You might ask, well, how did he see God's power if he was the first Christian martyr? Well, his eyes were opened. Verses 54 to 60. Now, when they heard these things, Stephen had been telling them about Jesus. When they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul who later became the Apostle Paul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he cried out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or died. Where was his angels? God was there. They were with him, giving him the strength for what he needed. When we see God's power, we understand that God will keep us from all harms or safely usher us into His arms. Amen. And we know that. We can't just say, well, He's going to always protect me from physical danger. This world is getting dangerous and Christians are being martyred all over the world. Have been for centuries, but it just seems like it's stepping up. And to think that it might not ever come to our country, well, that might be hopeful, wishful thinking. Maybe it won't and I hope it doesn't. But if it does, we need to be ready. And we need to say, I'm not going to duck, I'm not going to hide. Uh, there is a sifting going on, I believe it. There is a sifting going on, and there's going to be those who are going to remain faithful to God, and those who are, going to, who are, well, they were just Sunday church members. And we have to decide, where do we stand? But when we decide that, we can have faith and the strength of knowing that the angels are surrounding us, whether we live through whatever is happening or not. God is protecting us. He has the power to protect us here or to take us from here to there. Amen. Keep your eyes open and on Jesus and God will bring you safely through. When you open your eyes, you will see God's predominance, God's power, and God's plan. Amen. Verse 18. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. The enemy was struck blind. Elisha then walked out to the Syrians and convinced them, Oh, this is the wrong city. Did you know that? Uh, no, I'm not that guy. No, I'm not the guy you're looking for, but I can take you to him. I'll take you to the city where you want to go. 
He offered to lead them there, and since, well, they didn't have much choice, a whole blind army, what you going to do? This man seems like a nice fellow, going to lead us along the way. We'll go with him. And the soldier fought Elisha right into the heart of the city of Samaria. Then he prayed again, O Lord, open their eyes, the eyes of these men, that they may see. And as their vision returned, they realized they were surrounded by the Samaritan army. God's got a sense of humor. The king of Israel asked Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He sounded like he was, Oh boy, we're going to take an, do, do an end to these guys right now, boy. At least let me do it. But Elisha replied, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So the king made a great feast for them and then sent them home to Syria. And the story ends with these words from 2 Kings 6.23. And the Syrians did not come again on raids to the land of Israel. Amen. God always has a plan. Amen. God always has a plan. But like Elisha's servants, we must open our eyes to see it. We cannot keep them closed for fear, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has a plan. And you may be looking around at the situation in the world, the political situation where we're at now, and you may say, I don't see the plan. Get into God's Word. Start praying to God. Maybe God's saying, well, I'm not ready, quite ready for you to see the whole plan. But I got a plan. I've, I've read the end, folks. God wins. And we're on His side. It's okay. It's good. It's all right. Don't be so depressed. My goodness. You already know that God has a plan. Though for some of you it may be a little bit blurry and out of focus right now. Obscured by your surroundings, circumstance, and fears. But when you focus your faith through prayer like Elisha did, you'll begin to see God's unfolding plan more clearly. The world's gone crazy, hasn't it? Can, I, can you agree with me on that? Amen. The world has just gone crazy. Pandemics, political polarization, and unbridled pandemonium. These certainly were not things I had planned for. I went back, I looked at my calendar the last couple of years. I didn't, no one on that calendar didn't say pandemonium. Uh, this week we're going we're, we're gonna, to we're gonna have political polarization. And, and next week, look forward to it, Tom, there's pandemics coming. No, it's not on my calendar anyway. I did not plan. Did anybody else plan for this? No, we didn't plan for it. And we may not be able to see how it fits into God's plan right now. But the truth is, God is always in control. Always. I've lived enough in my life. When I was a young preacher, I might have said that in faith, but I've lived enough of my life now that I have seen it. I have, with my own eyes, I have seen it. I've been through some tough times in my life, and I know I'm going through some tough ones right now, too. We all are. But you know what? God's got a plan. God's got a plan. I believe that so much. Truth is, God is always in control. And His plans, His plans are never thwarted. So let's open our eyes and look for God's plan in the midst of the mayhem. When Elisha's servant first stepped out of the house that morning, can you imagine when he first stepped out of the house that morning, he couldn't see God's predominance, power, or plan. He could only see peril, problems, and possibly prison. Consequently, he was petrified and panic-stricken. Perhaps you can relate. In a climate of fear and foreboding, we need to learn to look not at the things that which are seen, but the things which are unseen. In this week... How many times have you looked at the unseen things? I'm, you can't count the hour you spent here with us at night. How many times have you looked at the unseen? And how much time have you been spending looking at the seen things? things you, how much time have you spent on cable news? 
Well, there's one of your problems right there. You know, know enough to know what's happening. The Bible says walk circumspectly, but don't spend hour after hour there. My goodness, you can see that. Trust what you can't see in God. Amen. Trust Him. Like Elisha, we need to see God's predominance, power, and plan. Let, let's pray to church. Let's pray that our enemies' eyes would be opened, the enemies of God's people, that their eyes would be opened, because when they are like the Syrians in our text, they're going to see the truth. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.31 And let's, let's pray that our own eyes will be opened as well, so that we will find courage, comfort, and hope in Jesus Christ every day, from the time we get up to the time we put our head back on our pillow at night. Have your eyes been opened to the truths that come only from the Creator of the universe? We are all sinners. Jesus died to save us from our sins, and we can have hope and a future only in Him. There is no hope and future in this world, folks. And all of us trying to hang on to this life and every breath we've got and worried about death coming, that's what everybody seems to be so worried about now. Remember this, that on the face of the earth, our life is that long. It's the dash between born and died on our tombstone. Just, just that long. But eternity goes on forever. And we can prepare for that now. And we can live forever. Ephesians 1.18 says, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance, in the saints. Don't you want to know the riches of this inglorious inheritance in the saints? Let your eyes be opened. I say see Him now. Or see Him later. Revelation 1-7 Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him. Even those who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of Him. Even so, even so, amen. If you have never opened your eyes to the gift of God through Jesus Christ, I pray you'll do that now. You know, Jesus came to this earth as the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God, lived a perfect life, because you and I couldn't live a perfect life died a cruel death because He was perfect, and then rose from the dead and ascended back into heaven. He's coming again just like this scripture we just read. He did all of that because of His love for you. He died on that terrible cross because of my sins and because of yours. Open your eyes and see the cross tonight. If you're a Christian who's been very lackadaisical in your walk and you just really haven't been living the Christian life, open your eyes. See the cross again and walk with Jesus in trusting faith, knowing we'll get through this. We'll get through this, brothers and sisters. And if you haven't given your life to Christ, open your eyes and see the cross today, the blood that was shed, and believe in that blood of Jesus Christ. Confess that He is the Son of the living God who died for you. Repent of your sins. Quit living the way of the world and turn to the cross of Christ and be buried with Him in the water grave of baptism and raised to walk in a brand new life. We can take care of that tonight. You can do that tonight. In just a moment when we sing, just step down here and take uh, Brother Malcolm's hand and say, Brother Malcolm, my eyes are open to the cross of Christ. I want to be a Christian. And He'll help you with that. Don't don't be afraid. Don't be nervous. The power of God is with you if you'll step out tonight. Come on, open your eyes and see the cross. Come as we stand and sing.